Good morning, Cross Point. We are 12 days into the new year. How are your New Year's resolutions going so far? You know, they tell us, whoever, whoever the psychologists are that work through the stats, they tell us that whenever you set a New Year's resolution, that 92% of people will be gone from their New Year's resolution by Valentine's Day. So we're not quite there yet. You guys are doing so far so good. That means only 8% of people actually keep their New Year's resolutions. Now we're in this series called You in Five Years. So we're taking a a long-term approach saying who are you going to be five years from now and who will you become if you continue in your present course? Now, did you know that if an airplane were to leave LAX and it were to go to LaGuardia in Queens, New York, and if it were to take off and the pilot were to be 1% off, just 1%, not that much, just one degree, one degree off, did you know that whenever that flight lands, it would actually land 155 miles away from LaGuardia? It would be two states away all because it was off by one degree. That's why we're in this series today, because we want to talk about the 1%. And that's what pilots will do, is they're constantly course correcting. So as we think about who God wants us to be now and who God has pointed us to be in the next five years, we want to make sure that we are course correcting. Now, we have this program that, that I rarely ever talk about on stage. Uh, it's kind of a, a, on the secret menu. You know when you go to In-N-Out, you know there's a secret menu, right? Uh, there's there's the, the, the animal fries. There, there's all these different things on the secret menu. It's not on the main menu. We, we have one of those programs here at Crosspoint on the secret menu. It's called Radical Mentoring. And uh, we rarely ever talk about it. I'm kind of curious, how many of you have been through Radical Mentoring? Just raise your hand. All right. We've probably had about 150 people go through it. We don't announce it. We don't talk about it. But Radical Mentoring is a program. It's a discipleship program where uh, you'll read a book a month. All right. So in a year period of time, you'll read nine books. You memorize two verses every week. Uh, If you're married, there's some marriage homework assignments. Listen, most people don't read a book in a whole year, let alone read a book a month. And we go through this program. There's a retreat on the beginning, retreat on the end, and it's this, this deep discipleship process. But in order to to get into the program, one of the very first assignments in the program that we ask is we ask you to write uh, your obituary. I know, it sounds really morbid, right? We ask you to write your eulogy. What what do you want your spouse to say about you when you die? Because when you die, some of you are going to be right here at Cross Point Church, okay? We're, we're going to do a funeral service. There's going to be a casket potentially right here. And your family is going to get up. They're going to do a little slideshow of your life. And your family is going to get up. What do you want your kids to say about you? What do you want your wife? What do you want your husband to say about you? And here's what's very interesting about this assignment, is very few people actually think about that moment. And can I tell you, I've been to so many funerals. I mean, I'm a pastor. I mean, that's what I do. I'm Mary, Barry. Okay, I mean, that's that's part of my life. And can I tell you what they're not going to say about you? They're not going to get up and say, man, he works so much. And, you know, I'm so grateful and thankful for all of the long, long, long hours that were invested can I tell you, I, I just don't hear about it in eulogies. You know what else I don't hear? I don't hear about, oh, we lived in this gigantic house. It was so awesome. We, we, we had this big, we don't hear about that. You know what I hear in the eulogies? I hear all about character traits. He loved me so much. We spent so much time. Let me tell you about this experience. I've got to tell you about this moment that made me laugh, that made us cry, that we got to enjoy together. They are more about character traits. So if you start with the end in mind, see, we're going five years out. You can go even further out than that and say, what do I want my family to say about me? What do I want my best friends to say about me? And we start with that. Then we back up to where we are right now and say, That's where we want to head because this is what we are looking for. And this is a big statement that I'm going to make make to you right now. God is more interested in who you are than what you do. 
God is more interested in who you are than what you do. Who you are is your character traits. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. My question is, what is in your heart? Because what's in your heart is going to overflow out of your life. That becomes the character of who you are. My, uh, my daughter and I, two years ago, it was during that little break before, uh, in between Christmas and New Year's, two years ago, uh, we, were, we were sitting down, we were talking, and I wanted to challenge her. She was 10 at the time. I wanted to challenge her to begin the pattern of reading God's word. At 10 years old, I wanted her to develop this habit. So her and I sat down and we said, let's do it together. And there's this Bible reading app we talk about called YouVersion. Over 400 million people have downloaded this Bible reading app. And there's Bible reading plans. And they do this thing called streaks on there. So if you start a streak, you do it two days in a, way, in a row, three days, it'll just build a streak. So I said, let's build a streak together. And my daughter is competitive like me. So at 10 years old, she said, all right, Dad, when somebody breaks their streak, what are they going to do? And I said, well, why don't you come up with something? And so she did watch this video. 725 days ago, Sadie and I made a bet that we would read our Bible every day, and whoever lost their streak would have to eat a bite of an onion. And I am so sad to admit that yesterday... <laughs> After 724 days, I failed to read my Bible yesterday. And so... So did I. And B-Man also failed after 500 and how many days? 594. 594 days. How ironic. <laughs> I'm so, so sad. So because of it, I will be eating this onion like an apple. gift it keeps giving. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it is finished. The streak <laughs> and the onion. And I'm crying. Now, I didn't shoot that video knowing I was going to show it to you, but my daughter said, we got to put this on video today. And I was heartbroken because I went 724 days, as did my daughter, reading my Bible every day, and I missed a day. And I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the first thing I did was grab my phone, and I looked at my Bible app, and it said, streak, one. And I was heartbroken. I couldn't, like, go back to sleep. Like, like I, I missed the streak. And, and Shannon woke up. And, I mean, have you ever, like, had a bad day and you just, like, let your spouse know all about it? Like, like not only am I going to live in misery, but she's going to live in misery over this as well. <laughs> and I was just head down moaning and groping. And, you know, I mean, just not groping. That's... that's, that's <laughs> get this back. This is hard. <laughs> moaning and groaning. <laughs> groaning. And I just, it was like the joy we just sucked out of my life. And ironically, I mean, as only God could do, right? My son wakes up and he has a conversation with his mom and she brings him into his room, and, and he's got his head down, and she's got her arm around him, and she says, just, just tell him. It's okay. Just tell him. And my now 10-year-old son said, Dad, I lost my streak today. On the exact same day that I lost my streak. And you saw in the video, his was like 500 and some days. And he was like so disappointed. 
And, and I had to like kick into dad mode of like, hey, what's most important is your character, <laughs> not a streak. And we are human beings, not human doings. That God is more concerned about who we are than what we do. And all the gods in heaven saying, you missed a streak. Kicking you out of heaven. God is not a killjoy. God is more concerned about our character. And so I had to have this conversation with my son about me missing a streak on the exact same day as well. And how we're not going to let it steal the joy out of our life. That we're all going to make mistakes. A righteous man falls down seven times, Proverbs says, but you get back up. And that's what we're doing, is we get one degree off, and what do we have to do? We have to course correct. We have to course correct. The question is, who are you becoming? Oftentimes, our distorted identity sabotages our success. Our distorted identity sabotages our success. There's a man in the Old Testament named Moses, and God had tapped Moses on the shoulder and said, Moses, I want you to deliver my people out of the bondage from Egypt. You're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to say, let my people go, and I've tapped you on the shoulder for such a time as this. I want you to step into what I've called you into. But Moses' distorted identity sabotaged his success. And he looked back at God and said, I don't have what it takes. I, I'm not the right one. I can't do this. He said, God, I, I can't talk. I have a, 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 a stuttering problem. And his distorted identity sabotaged his success. See, your identity is so important to understand who you are. God looked at Moses and he said, who made your tongue? Who made your mouth? Who's the one who called you? I called you. And it's not your strengths that are going to allow you to be able to step into this situation. It's not your strengths going to get you through this moment. It's your identity that is rooted in me. Your identity is so important. There's another man by the name of Gideon. And Gideon was another guy that God tapped him on his shoulders and said, hey, listen, I want you to step into this situation. But his distorted identity almost sabotaged his success because they're fighting the Midianites. And the Midianites were like sand on the seashore as far as how big their army was. And Gideon's army was much less. So Gideon went into hiding in the caves and said, I don't have what it takes. And God had to remind him that his identity is rooted in him. And God said, listen, Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. I've called you into this. You can't do this in your own power and in your own strength. But you've got to recognize your identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. So if you're going to figure out who I'm going to be, I want to give you three things. Number one is this. Who does God say you are? Who does God say that you are? I... My daughter's now 12, and uh, she loves to do bike rides around the neighborhood. So, so once a week, we go on a bike ride, and, and uh, we talk, and we talk about life. And, and she was telling me about some of her junior high drama right now. And so as we're talking through 12-year-old girl junior high drama, I told her, I said, Sadie, I want you to understand your identity. I want you to know who you are are in Christ. So I gave her this assignment. I said, I want you to read Ephesians chapter 1. And as you read through Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to see who God has created you to be because I want you to be secure. I don't want your identity, to your distorted identity to sabotage your success. And there's some lies that you may be tempted to believe. I want you to understand your identity. So just as I took my 12-year-old daughter through Ephesians 1, I want to take you through Ephesians chapter 1 today. And it's a powerful passage of scripture and understanding who we are. The Bible says this. It says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus, faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Then he says in verse 3, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has, what's the next word church? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms 
Not because you're so awesome. Not because you're so smart. Not because you're such a great leader. Not because you have so many, so much so great of people skills. I bless you because we are united with Christ. And in Christ, you are blessed. The first thing who God's created you to be, you say, I am blessed. Would you just say that with me right now? I am blessed. Would you not agree that you are blessed? Then he goes in verse 4, and he says, even before he made the world, God loved us. Let me say that again. God loved us before the beginning of the world, before he even created it. He chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God says to you today, I am loved. Would you say that with me right now? I am loved. You're not only blessed, but you're loved. And God doesn't love you based upon what you do. Even when you miss reading the Bible, God still loves you. God loves you unconditionally. Then he said in verse 4 that I am chosen. Did you see that in verse 4? He, he chose us. You know, I, I love watching the drafts. If you got the NBA draft, you got the NFL draft, and, and, and all these guys, you know, they're wearing like these fancy suits. And then they get their hat, and it says, the first pick in the 2020 NBA draft is, I want to tell you that in God's economy, you are the first pick in his draft. You are chosen. God says, I made you for me, and I want you. I've chosen you. I want you to be part of my family. I am chosen. Then he says in verse 4, he says, I am holy. I'm holy. That word holy means set apart. What, what God says is when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you become weird. You become weird. Holy, set apart, different. You start acting different. You start talking different. And that's why some of your family's like, what's wrong with you? You're acting a little weird. Can I tell you, I want to be weird. Normals, discouraged, depressed, defeated, divorced, broke. I don't want that. That's normal. I want to be weird. I want to be holy. I want to be set apart. I want to know God. I want to be conformed into the image of his son. I want God to lead and guide and direct my steps. I, I want you to be holy, to be set apart. God says, I am holy. Then this next one gets me. I, I love this. It says in verse 5, God decided in advance to, what's the next word, church? Adopt us. Many of you know I have a six-year-old adopted daughter. This one cuts deep to the core of who I am. And those of you that have adopted children, you know what I'm talking about. Listen to what it says. God decided to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. I love this part. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. You guys got a chance to hear Zach today do the verse of the month. Zach is uh, one of our high school students. He actually had a hockey game this morning, did a hat trick. After the hat trick, came over here, got showered real fast so he could do the verse of the month for us here at Crosspoint. How awesome is that? <laughs> Zach's been teaching in fifth and sixth grade as well too. He just feels like God's put it on his heart just to teach. And and uh, Zach sent me some pictures this past week of, of his family. And he's been asking me to pray. He, we go to the glass room and Zach comes and says, Pastor Brian, just pray for our family because we're adopting this little boy, Chase. And I got a picture of it this past week. And guys, I honor you guys and I celebrate you guys for adopting Chase and putting him part of your family. Do we have that other picture as well too? I love this little picture right here as well too. Just to see Zach's heart, to see your heart specifically for Chase and adopting him. And, and you know what? It's what you wanted to do, and it brings you great pleasure. Can I tell you? We were far away from God in our own sin, our selfishness, our stuff. And God says, I want to bring you to be part of my family. You've never had a family before. I want you to become part of the family of Christ. I am adopted. 
Then you look at verse 6. So we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Catch this. I am grace filled is what he says. Thank God for God's amazing grace. It covers our sins. Then he says in verse 7, he's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our, what's the next word, church? Freedom. We've been free with the blood of his son. I am free. Then go back, go back to that verse one more time. It says, he purchased our freedom, the blood of his son, and what's the next word, church? Forgiven. How awesome is that? I am forgiven. Would you say that with me? I am forgiven. My question is, do you know who you are? Listen, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, I was taking my son into L.A., and we were going to the Nerf Challenge. I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's 50,000 square feet of Nerf. Every 10-year-old's fantasy. And every dad's fantasy as well, too. And I got a phone call three days before we were going to go to this Nerf challenge down in L.A. And it was a guy in our church who so generously uh, called and said, Pastor Brian, I'd like to invite you and your son uh, to go to the Laker game. I was like, what? So <laughs> when is it? And so he told me, and it was on the same day we were going to Nerf challenge. Nerf challenge was in L.A. from 3 to 6. The game was at 7.30. I was like, God, this is ordained right here. <laughs> Just enough time for dinner in between. This is perfect. Well, we had three tickets because I was going to take his sister to Nerf Challenge too. But, you know, there's only two tickets to the Laker game, so she had to stay back. <laughs> <laughs> and we... We go down to L.A., we do the Nerf experience, it's amazing, but I have this third ticket. And in my heart, I'm like, I got to sell this ticket. I think we paid $30 for it. I mean, I, I got to sell it. Like, I gotta. So I go up to the counter, and, and they're like, no refunds. I'm like, well, I'm selling this ticket for 30 bucks, so I can't have this $30. I mean, that's a lot of money, $30. So, so I'm like telling Braden, like, we got to sell this ticket. And there's, there's a couple guys that are like right outside the window, like young adults, and they're like waiting for people to come up. And I tell these young adults, hey, listen, how many guys have tickets? And they're like, listen, like one out of 20 doesn't have a ticket. I said, tell you what, I'm going to sell you this ticket, okay, for 20 bucks. You'll make 10, okay, you can kind of, you're going to be here anyway. It's kind of a deal. And they're like, no, no, we're good. All right, 15, 15, no, 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 we're going to be good. We're we're gonna be good. We're gonna be good. I'm like, man, I, I'm, I'm gonna stand here for as long as it takes to be able to sell a thing. So I go and use the restroom, come back out, and Braden says, Dad, why don't we just give that ticket away? We're generous. And I had to be reminded by my 10 year old son of what my identity is in Christ. Here I am. Somebody gave us Laker tickets. And I can't give away a Nerf Challenge ticket. I'm like, son, I have forgotten my identity of who I am. You're right. As Moors, we are generous people. And right at that same time, this family comes up, and it was a dad who didn't have a ticket. And he had five of their family members that were right there. And those young adults said, see that guy right there? He'll sell you a ticket. And I said, I'm not selling you a ticket, man. Enjoy your day with your family. But it's so easy to forget our identity, isn't it? So identity to forget. It's so easy to forget who we are in Christ. Who are you when no one else is looking? Who are you when you're by yourself? Who are you on your phone? Who are you under your own roof? Listen, if you can't manage your own household, how are you, how's God going to trust you business and leadership and, and sales and more things around if you can't be the same person outside of your house that you are inside your house? And then here's the third and final challenge. What's going to be your word for the year? Who do you want to become this year? What's your word for the year? This may replace a New Year's resolution for you this year. I want to challenge you to pick out one word. Say, God, give me a word in 2020. This isn't what you do. This is who you are. And you, you should have received a little thing. Do you have a little thing in your notebook or inside your program? Is there a little, little card in there? See what God can do through you. And if you'll pull that up, see what God can do through you. 
should be inside your program. It says a word. And I want to challenge you just to take it and write down a word. I'm going to say some words, and maybe one of these words will resonate with you today. Maybe your word, maybe you got your own word, but maybe for some of you, your word this year is going to be brave. For some of you, your word may be faith. For some of you, it may be generosity. What's your word this year? Is it loyalty? Is it courage? Is it depth? Is it boldness? Is it boundaries? Focus? Determination? Vision? Love? Gratitude? Service? Health? Peace. That was my word last year was peace. Have my word peace. What does peace look like for me? Maybe it's reflection. Maybe for some of you it's recovery. This is a year of recovery from a hurt, a habit, a hang up. For some of you it may be kindness. Consistency. That was my word three years ago. I found that, that I'm just not consistent. But then I realized I am consistent. I'm, I'm off and I'm on. I'm consistently inconsistent. <laughs> How to grow in consistency. Commitment. Grace. Maybe your word's grace this year. Just showing grace. Is it joy? This is a year of joy for me. Compassion. Forgiveness. This is a year of forgiveness for me. Is it growth? Is it giving? I don't know your word, but I want to challenge you to pray about your word for this year. And where is it you need to see a breakthrough in your life? And then this is where the power comes back in. Now find a verse that matches back to your word. Find the promise that comes from your word. As you know, there are over 7,000 promises found in the word of God. Find your verse. If it's peace, then memorize the verse that says the peace of God passes all understanding. Is it, is it faith? Hebrews eleven six 6 says without faith it's impossible to please God. Is it love? 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says love never fails. Find your word. Ask God to give you your word for the year. Find your scripture that is the promise so that you can relate who you are in Christ. More important than what you do is who you are. And then my final challenge is this. We're starting today, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we're starting right now, right after this is over, we're gonna spend the next 21 days giving 2020 to God. That this be a year where that word and that breakthrough and that promise from God comes to pass in your life. So over the next 21 days, I want to challenge you to specifically be praying over your word. Praying for a breakthrough this year in your life. And we're starting a Bible reading plan together starting tomorrow. 21 days. And if you want to just take a picture of that, you can take a picture of it. You can... Get that picture, you can scan it, it'll automatically open up in you version, the Bible reading plan, so that we can read the word of God together over the next 21 days. And you say, what is prayer and fasting? Fasting, it doesn't mean you're going to fast food. Some like, oh, fast food, I could do that for 21 days. <laughs> no, what we're going to do is we're going to fast something. For some of you, it may be social media. Maybe you need to go on a social media cleanse. For some of you, you may want to fast coffee. I know that's a big one. That's what Shannon did last year. And the congregation goes, <gasps> <laughs> maybe for some of you, you need to give up some sweets. Maybe for some of you, some of the music you got going on in your life. Maybe you want to give up some of the music. Maybe, maybe some of you watch some movies. Maybe you say, I'm, I'm going to cleanse that for a little while. Well, what is it that you're going to fast from so you can feast on God? Listen, 2020, I believe, can be your best year ever. And 2020 will set the course for where you will go in 2025. Let's set the course. Even if we're one degree off, it can lead to a different def a destination than where we're headed. So, church, I want to challenge you to give God your best. Now, at this time, 
I want to ask our prayer team to come forward. And we're going to sing a couple worship songs together. And I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up front right now. And if you need some special prayer, now is the time to be able to come forward. We're going to worship. If you want to pray in your seat, pray in your seat. If Say, God, give me a word. Maybe that's your prayer over these next two worship songs. You say, God, give me a word, and he'll give you a word. Just keep that. You say, God, well, what's my verse? Listen, you can go back. You can use your Google. You can do your, your research assistant, Google, to figure out a verse if you want to. God will give it to you. Now, take these, take these forms, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do with them. I'm going to ask you to take these, and I'm going to ask you to put them in your bathroom mirror this year. Don't put them in your purse. Lady, you put them, ladies, you put them in the purse. It's like the abyss. It's the dark hole. <laughs> Never be able to find it. Guys, don't put them in your wallet. You won't find them in your wallet. You'll be digging out in your wallet two years from now and say, oh, yeah, verse of the year. Put it on your bathroom mirror, and when you brush your teeth this year, that's a time to be able to pray and ingrain, this is my identity. This is who I am. This is my word for this year. You ready, church? We're praying for a breakthrough in 2020. You guys ready to do this, church?